Our presentation today is really an exciting one. It's 25 million stitches, one stitch, one refugee. Kim, Jennifer Kim Song will be sharing a presentation along with guest participants, Elaine Archibald and Maggie Rezeki Hiltner. I wanted to tell you a little bit about SDA. Founded in 1977, SDA is a national membership nonprofit consisting of artists, educators, students, and enthusiasts from around the world. SDA is known for its high caliber quarterly journal, which I have here in front of me, the latest edition. But members also participate in exhibitions, regional groups, grants and awards. Members often work in a variety of fiber media, migrating from one to another, depending on ideas they'd like to convey. As an artist myself, I find this particularly exciting. Join us on our website and on social media for a robust portrait of SDA and the interests and activities of our members. Textile Talks is a collaboration between six textile nonprofits, the International Quilt Museum, the Modern Quilt Guild, Quilt Alliance, San Jose Museum of Quilt and Textiles, Studio Art Quilt Associates, and SDA. These talks would not exist without the support of our 10 sponsors shown in this slide. Please thank them when you place an order. As a side note, I'm, I personally am also a SACWA member and have an interview included as part of Quilt Alliance's Save Our Stories. My personal goals at SDA are promoting our field and enabling the practice of current artists, artists from underrepresented communities and the next generation of artists working with textiles. About the format of this presentation, Jennifer will speak for about 20 minutes. For the next 10 minutes after that, we'll have Elaine and Maggie comment about their involvement with this project. And after that, we'll open up the presentation to questions. You can submit your questions at any time using the Q&A box, which is to the right at the perimeter of your screen. Putting your questions there instead of the chat box makes it easier for us to address and manage them. This website will be recorded and available for later viewing on the SACWA website and YouTube. So let's get started with a few words about our participants. Jennifer, Kim San, and Elaine are both from California. Jennifer's personal artwork explores environmental and social issues. Her training as a graphic designer highlighted the need for message and showed how persuasive visual communication can be. She tells us, as an immigrant artist and activist, my goal was to provide an outlet for stitchers to voice their support of refugees and to engage the public in conversations about the refugee crisis. I started the project by providing fabric panels and instructions to those who expressed a desire to participate. To my utter amazement, 13 months since the launch of the project, we have amassed 25 million stitches. They are a creative expression of solidarity with the world's refugees. Also appearing today, Elaine Archibald is a retired environmental scientist who specialized in the protection of drinking water quality. She joined this project because she was inspired by Jennifer's vision for educating people about the refugee crisis. And she wanted to help with the project's organizational aspects. You'll hear about that later. From Montana, Mose uh, Maggie Rezeki Hiltner, who is also a SACWA member, is a full-time textile artist who specializes in embroidery and social activism. Her work has been included in numerous national and international exhibitions and has been published in the US and abroad. As the coordinator of Red Lodge Art of Resistance, she facilitates participation in projects such as 25 million stitches. Now it's time to pass the baton to Jennifer her presentation will first focus on some helpful graphs and information about this issue. 
and then move into exploring individual panels and the groups that create them. I'm excited to listen, and I hope you are too. Jennifer, your turn. I would like to thank both SACWA and SDA for giving us the opportunity to present 25 million stitches, one stitch, one refugee. I'll share how the project was conceived, our progress in the last 13 months until we reached our goal, the, some refugee statistics, and of course, the panels and stories by our stitchers. In April 2019, I came across UN data that was very alarming. It reported that there are over 25 million refugees in the world. In my own struggle to comprehend this astronomical number, I wanted to create a, a data-driven work, which would provide a tangible clarity of the number of people affected. The first thing I did was to go buy a Sushiko quilting machine with the ambition of stitching all 25 million stitches on my own. Well, three days and 12,000 stitches later, I broke the machine, which made me reassess my medium and the message this work would convey. Up to this point, I have never done a collaboration, but I felt that this project would be most meaningful if a large global community could come together and stitch all 25 million stitches by hand. And that's how the project was born. I have a disclaimer here. Many of the panel images are cropped to show details. And in some cases, the panels are slightly distorted to fit the frames. The mission for this community art project was to engage with the public, to sustain a conversation about the refugees, and to visually represent 25 million people. And I wished that the long hours of stitching would empower each stitcher to believe in his or her ability to make a difference for the refugees, as I had experienced through my previous artwork on this crisis. Four years ago, when news of Syrian and African refugees were being reported weekly, I shied away feeling overwhelmed by the immense human suffering. Still, I couldn't shake off the desperation I saw on the refugee parents and their children's expressions and body languages. So I started a visual journal, seeing and recording one refugee or family a day. Within a week of sketching, I was surprised to feel the weight of my hopelessness lifting and in its wake, I discovered a budding courage that I might be able to speak on their behalf, which is how I continued with this, making art on this difficult topic and felt that I could organize a global community project. Here are some of the statistics from a 2018 UN Refugee Agency's report that inspired my original call to action. Among 25 million refugees counted, over half were younger than 18. Today, one person is forcibly displaced nearly every two seconds. Of nearly 80 million displaced people worldwide, only about 100,000 have been resettled which is slightly more than one out of 1,000 people. In the bottom left graph, which shows the data from 2009 to 2016, the darker blue signifies the number of refugees fleeing human conflict, while the light blue represents the number of refugees displaced by the natural disasters. This graph shows that the environmental disasters create four to 11 times the number of refugees compared to those fleeing home due to human violence. In the top left graph, we can see the number of displaced people worldwide is growing at an exponential rate. 
having doubled since 2010 and quadrupled since 2000. The bottom graph shows the number of refugees from Muslim countries who were allowed to resettle in US. From year 2016 on the left, 2017 in the center, and 2018 on the right, which shows zero. The New York Times reported that the first six months of 2019, 7 million people were displaced worldwide, mostly as a result of extreme weather. That seems like a huge number, but here are a few disasters that visited 2019. In Chennai, India, a city of 9 million residents that used to boast its fresh and abundant reservoirs ran out of water completely. The UN estimates that about 60 million more from Bangalore, Hyderabad, and Delhi will face similar crisis soon. We also saw that the 20 million acres of Amazon rainforest were set on fire while the extreme heat and fire in Australia consumed 3 million acres. That is 8 million more acres than all of England. I came across this powerful poem that speaks eloquently about the human suffering that is born out of the refugee crisis. It is written by a Somali refugee, Warson Shire. There are 11 stanzas in the complete poem. I took six through eight stanza to pair with this beautifully rendered panel by Christine from Washington State. You have to understand, no one puts their children on a boat unless the water is safer than the land. Let me pause here to give you time to read. The entire poem is readily available on the internet. Now back to the project. My initial call for the stitchers was met with an almost dismal response, perhaps because the artists who might try to recruit all knew how big a commitment hand stitching a 60 inch long panel would be. I was blissfully unaware of the daunting scale of such an endeavor. So I eagerly went about imploring for participation from my yoga studio, book club, art groups, family and friends, and learning many organizational skills on the go. Some of the lessons I learned each week were quite basic. The majority of participants were from the general public, novice stitchers, school children, and volunteers with limited time, in addition to the textile artist. It dawned on me that the project had to fit the participants' need and lifestyle. So we adopted to a more manageable panel size. The original 60 inch long panel shrank to 30, then to 15 inches at the peak enrollment when we were sending out over 30 panels a week. The initial recruitment was slow. Although we heard from many people who shared our enthusiasm for the project, seven months into the project in January of this year, we barely had 2 million stitches counted. We owe our thanks to our growing community of volunteers. who are able to keep our enthusiasm for the project alive with their many ideas. How better to stay in contact with participants, organizing and running, running sewing circles, offering their skills on the technical front and wordsmithing our newsletter. My goal for the installation of the completed project is to mirror our interconnectedness. Just as every person is united through family, community, culture, and species, each stitch is presented on a panel, each of which is joined into a long vertical flag. And the flags together represents one large textile artwork a community expression of what 25 million human refugees in the world look like. 
I want to say a little bit about how I chose hand stitching as a means to tally the number of refugees. I felt that the comforting medium of hand stitching would be an unthreatening way to invite a potentially social discussion around the refugees. Textile media uniquely exudes a traditional feeling of home. The panels serve as a visual reminder of the enormous number of people who no longer have their homes. Sewing was once an activity that was part of everyone's domestic landscape. And in many of the home countries of the refugees, it still is. Stitching is a way to mend something, to fix something that's broken. So I feel that symbolically, our collective stitching is an act of mending our world. We had barely 100 stitchers recruited when Rosma, a Lithuanian college student learning about the project through social media, emailed to say that she would like to recruit stitchers from Lithuania. This news was a much needed booster shot for our project. Rosma and Eisti, our two angels, knocked on many local doors to coax participation from a reluctant older generation by reminding them of the hardship they endured from many invaders throughout their history. Once these stitchers were on board though, they were committed and became ardent advocates for the cause. As you can see, embroidery is a thriving craft in Lithuania and we received 68 amazing panels from Rosma's group after they held a smashing local show of the 25 million stitches project. Photos of Lithuanian panels and the growing presence on the social media finally helped the project to gain traction. So a larger number of people started to sign up from all over the world. Now, I'd like to share some common themes that inspired the work from our community. About 12 stitchers made appeals to the ideals symbolized by the Statue of Liberty. Although US closed its doors to all Muslim immigrants in 2018, the message of our stitchers was clear uphold our national creed and honor our collective heritage of building this nation with the diverse talent and cultures from all parts of the world. Thanks to our volunteers who organized many sewing circles around the world and the five we led in various museums in Sacramento, Chico, Sebastopol and San Jose, we enjoyed a large level of participation from schools all the way from kindergarten to college level. A kindergarten class in Rhode Island, elementary school in Dominican Republic, middle school in Saskatchewan, Canada, and Maine, high schools in North Carolina, New York, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, and Indiana, Waldorf schools across the country, Cornell University's Museum Club, Minnesota College of Arts and Design, and UC Davis textile design class are some examples. All told, some 400 students, including homeschoolers, adopted 25 million stitches into their curriculum. Hope was another prevalent theme, represented by rainbows, balloons, hearts, stars, butterflies, homes, birds, trees, and circles of unity. Of course, the words themselves were central to the panel designs. Well wishes in many languages appear on our panel. Many sent notes saying how they found the long hours of stitching to be so meaningful to them. And I have come to believe that witnessing others suffering and not turning away from it is an act of compassion. Flags and graphs made the focal design of some panels. Here, I'll show you two panels that capture statistics of the refugees. 
What you see on the edges of circular graphs are the names of countries that the refugees are leaving behind, traveling en route or hoping to resettle. Nancy, our stitcher related being undone emotionally, realizing the hardship for the refugees who are tracking across the globe, when her hand and needles kept getting lost, trying to stitch across a 10 inch circle on a graph. The family theme was popular, not just in images, but in stories that evolved around stitching. I'm going to share two stories. The panel on these screen, however, are not by those whose stories I'm about to relay. One participant listed four generations of her family contributing to her panel. The panel used was once her grandmother's tablecloth, her grand granddaughter, to the yarn that used for the stitching, her daughter and herself stitched. Another stitcher shared an intimate story and a very lost hand for it by her ailing mother. She reminisced in the long chemo sessions, stitching side by side, how she appreciated being able to check up on her mother by stealing glances without arousing her mother's anxiety was also intent on stitching. Both the mother and daughter were grateful for the hours they could focus on and give to a cause that was bigger than their immediate worries. We had a request for 60 blank panels from a refugee resettlement center in Blackburn, England. The refugees, referred to as service users, we're interested in stitching for the project. The director has been in communication with me and shared how the project has had a tangible impact for the people she worked with. By the time they got to Blackburn, many refugees were cautious, afraid to share their hardship to one another, even after arriving in England. But stitching together thawed their hesitance to open up and brought a much needed sense of community. There were many, many renditions of hands, hands of solidarity, hands reaching out across the barriers. Notes accompanying many panels also contained stories of generosity and hope. I was particularly inspired by our senior stitchers. A few in their 90s put in few lines Many octogenarians stitched multiple panels. One said that participating gave their group a sense of purpose, something that seems to slip away each day. A participant with her MS asked her husband to build a sewing frame so she could stitch with her other arm. In summary, our stitching community represents a long list of countries and about 2,200 participants. India, Vietnam, China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, Tanzania, South Africa, the Netherlands, Iceland, Ireland, Italy, Lithuania, Germany, the United Kingdoms, Poland, Romania, Russia, France, Spain, Austria, Mexico, Ecuador, Uruguay, Dominican Republic, Brazil, Canada, and the 48 states in the US. Also, we enjoyed the diversity of participation from many different religious groups, including Quakers, Baptists, Catholics, Muslims, Hindus, Jewish faith, and the Church of Latter-day Saints. 25 million is a massive number. As a thought experiment, let's guess how far 25 million railroad ties would get us. Well, 25 million ties are enough to connect San Francisco to New York twice over. Yet in June of 2020, 13 months since I launched the project, we surpassed 25 stitches. We created this video to celebrate our collective achievement. This 3D walkthrough of our inaugural show in June 2021 is rendered by Joe Weber. 
This installation creates an experiential textile art piece that allows visitors to walk among the panels in order to feel and see the enormity of the number of people dislocated from their homes. The look and the scale of the show will vary from venue to venue, but I'm certain that in every case, it will be a deeply moving experience for all visitors. The 25 Million Stitches community are thrilled and amazed at our collective achievement. Naturally, we'd like to share our work as widely as possible. We would like to debut in states bordering Mexico, followed by those areas where we have large participation in the United States. Our international aspiration is to bring the show to European cultural event in Connors, Lithuania in 2022. To that end, I'd like to convince you to be our ambassadors, to reach out to your local museums and exhibition venues to bring the 25 million stitches installations to your town. If you'd like to help us fund the traveling exhibit, we have set, set up um, GoFundMe 25 million stitches to view more panels. Please go to our social media site Instagram 25 million stitches. For more information, please visit 25 million stitches.com. Thank you. Jennifer, thank you so much. That was a really amazing, wonderful presentation. Thank you. And what a big achievement to get this far. I, I'm, I'm amazed at the 2 million just earlier this year and now 25 million. That was a shock for us too. I mean, very, very happy um, surprise. So I guess it was like the snowball effect. We had a lot, we had sent out quite a few um, panels, maybe about 1300, but we couldn't really expect how many to get back. So when we reached 25 million stitches in, um, was it early May, Elaine? We, we were just um, thrilled. At this, at this time, uh, Elaine and Maggie, would you make your screens live? And um, uh, Elaine, would you um, unmute? <laughs> I think I'm unmuted. Okay, great. Great, okay. Wonderful, and we can go to gallery view so we can have a little discussion here. Um, we would like to uh, first we'll talk to both Elaine and Maggie about their involvement in this and then we have a lot of great questions. Uh, this is often the most interesting, well not the most, but a really fruitful part of the textile talk is when people get to ask questions. So Elaine, I know you're a very important person because you're one of the chief <laughs> ditch counters. Can you um, explain that process. That is one of the questions we, one or several of the questions we had in the Q&A. And oh, one more thing, put your questions in the Q&A box. It helps us see what we're doing there. Thank you. Um, sure, thanks Astrid. Um, yeah, I got involved in the project initially by telling Jennifer that, uh, we're neighbors by the way, that I would stitch one of the panels. Well, I soon realized, like Jennifer did, the enormity of this effort and volunteered to help with some of the organizational aspects of the project so that Jennifer could focus on recruiting volunteers to stitch and recruiting venues to display the panels once we got them in. So one of my tasks what initially was to count the panels when they did come back in. And at first I thought, okay, we're gonna count every stitch on every panel. And then I realized that, you know, I'd still be counting panel number 12 or something at this point. So Jennifer came up with this process that we could use that would help us count a subset of the panel 
and then come up with an average number of stitches. And what we did was for panels that were basically, you know, long running stitches, we used this and we would count the number of stitches in the rectangle. And then we would just multiply by the area of the panel. Um, for the panels that were more complicated, which Jennifer showed you many of them, we used these squares, a larger one and a smaller one. And we tried to count representative areas of the panels, some that were, had many, many stitches and others that were more, you know, just fewer stitches in an area. And again, then we just came up with an average. So by the time we were done, we had, oh, I don't know, three or four other people helping count the panels. And that's how we were finally able to get to the end of all of this. Um, but it's been just such an amazing journey. I, I enjoyed opening up every envelope and looking at the panels as they came in and just amazed by the, the people who had such vision and had such talent. Um, so for me, it's, it's just been wonderful. And I've thoroughly enjoyed all my time on this project and continue to enjoy it. And Jennifer's wonderful to work with. So, um, Elaine, we had one of the volunteers say, yes, we were asked to count our stitches. I ended up having to guesstimate as I lost count a couple times. I ended up doing around 2,500 stitches. This was Jenny Crystal. Yes, we... We had many volunteers who, after stitching or while during their, the process of stitching, they counted for us. And that was always just such a lifesaver when the panel came in with a little note saying 2,500 stitches or 10,000 stitches, because then we could just enter the stitches directly into the spreadsheet that we were maintaining to keep track of all the panels and all the stitches. So that was, that was super helpful when we had people do both the stitching and the counting. Wonderful. Well, I know we have some other questions, but I wanted to ask you personally, um, were, was there any other element of being involved with this project that drew you to it before we move on to Maggie? <laughs> well, yeah, initially it was just, you know, Jennifer is just so inspirational. And she and I started talking about the refugee crisis. And, you know, I have to say, I'm not an artist. And so to have somebody with that kind of vision and talent come up with something like this, I just thought was, was wonderful. And I thought, well, I can, you know, I'm a scientist. I can bring my organizational skills and my Excel skills to this project and help out in that way. And so it's just been, I think Jennifer and I have made a good team and uh, she's the creative inspirational one and I'm the one that kind of gets things, you know, the organizational things done. That's wonderful. That sort of leads us a little bit to Maggie. Um, Maggie, I wanted to ask you about how you um, got involved in the project, what inspired you to do it and a little bit about your stitching circle. Sure. sure. I did write some things down so I don't ramble on too long. So um, I've been doing this kind of project. Um, I've been bringing art activism to my town, my tiny Montana town of 2,500 people since 2012. Um, under, I call my group, uh, Red Lodge Art of Resistance. So I encourage community participation and engagement with local and national and international issues. So I keep my eye out for events like this that speak to me and my community. So I got started with this with Helen Klebestel and Allison Gates' incredible exquisite uterus project. Uh, and then hosted, we did uh, Women Do It, which was a traveling postcard exhibition, which was part of the International Caucus of the Women's Caucus for Art. Uh, we did Pulled Poles here in the community. That's one by Penny Mateer and her amazing group in Pittsburgh. And most recently, my community made over 50 squares for Ann Morton's Violet Protest. So um, I like my making events to tie in with voter advocacy and women's rights organizations in my state, like having speakers from Planned Parenthood or a voter registration table. For 25 million stitches, uh, we started, we did, I held the, a public stitching event on June 20th, 2019 on World Refugee Day. 
and I had found this probably right in the beginning when Jennifer advertised it. I just immediately was drawn to this project. And it's been so interesting seeing it evolve over time from um, the very beginning where we were filling panels to all of these incredibly personal individual artworks that the panels have evolved into over the over the time period. So after our first initial stitch day, it, uh, two other stitch parties emerged um, hosted by local local participants who just got really drawn to the party. Um, at these, I shared information about the project, of course, but also the materials that Jennifer provided. And um, people were able to take home the graphics and the handouts and the talking points about the refugee crisis. Then the panels got all were collected and we hung them at the local activist cafe, Honey's, for the month of August 2019, along with a panel about the project and the issues it highlighted. So here in Red Lodge, we had 43 different stitchers, local and visiting work on the panels, and we completed about eight panels in that month. I live in a tourist town, so hundreds of people were exposed to the project through the cafe and the walk, walking by that and the events or the social media exposure on Facebook. So um, I had no idea. I'm a stitcher and I stitch every day, so of course I would do this one. <laughs> I had no idea that it had such a big exposure to the tourists and people who are not stitchers. That's wonderful. I knew that there were a lot of people um, in the eight panels that you said, I mean, a lot of stitchers who got to stitch on the eight panels that you sent. Thank you. You're welcome. My strategy was try to keep them and make them finish these panels because I was watching how <laughs> It goes out into the world and can be put down and picked up. So I tried to get it. They had a time, a, you know, we were going to get these done and get them to you as quickly as possible. Uh -oh. Astrid, I think you're. Yeah. Maggie, um, what was the time frame that you actually gave them? That's an interesting question. We just had. Um, we started in June and they hung in, in the beginning of August. So we had two months to get our panels okay. finished. Wonderful. So. I know we have some interesting questions here that uh, um, great uh, are for the various members of this group. Thank you so much, Maggie. And I have to say, Maggie is just a wonderful stitcher in her own right. Check out her website. I've always been attracted. Um, we were wondering, first and foremost, if you're accepting more panels at this point. Can you speak to that, Jennifer? Yes, uh, we will continue accepting the panels until September 30th. Um, on our website, there is a panel request form. We're not sending out panels anymore, so you have to provide your own panel. But we do get something like maybe five panel requests, which means that they're just um, joining into the project. And since the number of refugees has risen to, I think, 26 million, uh, we'll accommodate all the panels that we receive until September 30th. And uh, okay, and then uh, just to let people know, there's a Google form there on the website to fill out, uh, to make things easier for the organizers here to yes. manage this project. The other question we had was, um, uh, people noticed that originally the panels were long and now they're smaller. What is the size you're currently using? Well, anything that's 15 inches in width and the length, uh, we're actually open to any length. 15 by 15 is used by many schools. Um, one of the panel that you saw in the very beginning where uh, pair of hand is cradling uh, a boat full of refugee, that is one of those smaller panels. So we don't really have a preference. You can choose whatever panel size you want, as long as one end is 15 inches. And do you then um, composite these panels that you get from people to make one large one? And is it, is, do you finish them? Is it backed or is the stitched side visible from the back in your installation? plans? Okay, so um, we have to fess up, Elaine. We're counting <laughs> stitches on both sides. So um, some of the stitching uh, panels that come 
uh, with the stitching numbers, we doubled them. You're going to be able to see both sides of the panel as you walk through them. Um, so they're not backed. There are people who back their panels, which is fine. Um, the way we assemble them, we have been fortunate to have maybe uh, up to like six volunteers who arrange them and stitch them together. Uh, we realize that it uh, depends on the venue, like the first one in at the Verge, where the ceiling height is um, probably over 20 feet, we're going to have a 14 feet long flags, but not many venues will have that um, height. So we will have to adjust the installation, the look of it, and how many panels belong in one flag. Um, but I'm leaving it to the community to design the flags or assemble the flags themselves. Okay, so I think I answered that question about the display having vertical panels, but the ones shown are horizontal. That's how you will composite them together. Yeah, um, they'll be vertically oriented, whether yeah. the design is horizontal or vertical. Um, do you have uh, an idea of how many total panels were submitted? Elaine, you might be able to answer that too. Yeah, I'd have to look at our spreadsheet to get the latest number, but I think we're up to about 2,200 now. And so that's going to, I mean, the Verge Center for the Arts in Sacramento has this nice large room that we're going to be able to use and we'll be able to display all of the panels there. But I think Jennifer is also open to smaller venues where we can display a subset of the total number of panels. Okay, um, another question, does the panel have to be white? Well, that's what we prefer, um, white or off-white, but we have had some people who have decided to hand dye their panels with natural materials, and we've had people who have, I think Jennifer mentioned, one panel was stitched on you know, great-grandmother's uh, tablecloth, We've had other people use dish towels from their family. Um, so we're open to just about anything. Most of the panels though are, are on white muslin. And then uh, since you talk about the end of September for um, accepting panels, is that the time that they have to be received by or is that the time they have to sign up to do it? Oh, um, so I had rented a PO box and September 30th is the last day that I'll have that PO box. So I guess the answer is I need to receive them. We need to receive them by then. Okay. Well, we have a number of really great questions dealing with content of the stitches. Um, first of all, Elaine, did you make your own panel? Oh, yeah. I did. I, I made one panel and I'm actually still working on two panels. One is one that I'm doing myself and another is one that I'm recruiting various family members to help with. So it will be a panel by, I guess, four generations of my family. Great. Wonderful. And how do you all decide which panels fit together? How do you curate them into, you know, long panels? Um, so for the Verge show, we either put a very bold graphic on top or um, there are many panels that were just straight lines of running stitch. So those might be go going on top. The ones with words that people would like to read are usually at the eye level. And then we just mix and match so that it's not, um, predominantly too colorful or too uh, monochromatic. So it's just basically by feel. Okay. Um, by the way, we do have some questions relating to the exhibition display. We'll, we'll deal with those as a group in a minute. Um, I wanted to, how did you handle the receipt of panels with political messages contrary to the spirit of 25 million stitches? Were any rejected? 
No, none at all. Um, we have uh, we have panels with strong opinions, um, mostly the hardship that the refugees are facing. Usually, um, the strong messages were about children being imprisoned, and those were images, but we have not received one that is um, against having any refugees or helping any refugees or supporting refugees, right, Elaine? That's right, and I think some of the, the strongest messages came in panels that showed children's faces or children's bodies behind barbed wire. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would open the panels and just think, oh my God, this is what we are doing in this country. And again, I would just be so amazed that that's where, well, now I'm getting political. So. Well, and uh, this is a good question for Maggie. Um, uh, just a second, I lost it here. Uh, Maggie, uh, the, the questioner was asking if you got pushback from your neighbors in Montana. Isn't it a more conservative area? Oh, no, not at all. Um, so Red Lodge is sort of a progressive little town in a big red state. And so, and Honey's Cafe where I collaborate with them, we're always working on, um, it's, it's more a place for open dialogue, you know, and, and I think a lot of these issues approach, you know, I think, I think the way an art activism project works is that it's, as your hands are busy, you're kind of pondering these issues and, and they don't just hit really hard on um, partisan issues. It's the same with Ann Morton's project right now, um, that the Violet protest is about bipartisanship. So the kind of projects like this one, these are about human issues. And I, I think that, I think then you're, it doesn't instantly flare up, you know, as a, as a partisan issue, so. Yeah, um, there's a question here. What was, for Jennifer or Elaine, what was the most surprising theme you saw in multiple panels? If you have an answer. Well, for me, I, Jennifer showed many of them. The number of panels we got with, um, you know, images of the Statue of Liberty and they were all so artfully done and beautiful. And I mean, I just thought some of those were great. I mean, we had lots and lots of wonderful panels, but the Statue of Liberty ones really resonated with me. The, I think I showed maybe 60 panels in this presentation and we have 2,200. So um, there was one if it, they were horizontally formatted, I, I didn't use them because the, the frames on uh, PowerPoint and the way I was dividing it didn't really work that well. But there was this one panel that said invisible in white thread on white paper. Oh, it was not invisible um, in white thread and white um, panel. And that was a powerful one for me. Yeah, I can see that. Um, another question that we have just related to that, did you suggest the stitching style or technique? And I, I assume everybody made came up with their own <laughs> imagery, but um, I noticed that many of the stitch seemed to be rendered in a running stitch style. If there is, was there, were there suggestions of what would work well or was that totally up to uh, people? Well, I thought that people would just do running stitches up and down the panel because um, otherwise I was asking so much of their time and their energy. But once we started posting uh, the panel images on social media, it almost became not a competition, but there were so much buzz about, you know, which one is uh, very powerful or how, which one they resonated. And people ended up using whatever stitch they wanted to use. 
there, there was one that was done completely by um, French knots. Oh yeah, that's right. And we were counting them five stitches because <laughs> probably five times that they um, went around the needle. So that was Rachel Courtney on the chat. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, I have some general stitches. And then, um, did you have anyone use machine stitches, or did they have to be hand stitched? Well, we asked for hand stitching. There are a couple that uh, was machine stitched and we're definitely going to keep them in. Um, there was one that you saw with, I don't know, maybe 50 flags. I can't imagine that one was done by hand. Yeah. Um, but there are really maybe less than 5% or not even that, 3% of the, the whole 2200 panels. Okay, I think it would be interesting to talk a little bit about um, venues that might, how do we get the word out farther and how, how people are able to see it in other ways, besides on social media, which you can see a lot of the images there. Um, there are people wondering, um, um, just a second, oh, what is the square footage needed for an ex exhibition venue? Do you know that? And if uh, the, some of these questions, I would say, if we can't answer them here, you're welcome to email uh, Jennifer and Elaine at 25millionstitches.com to get some answers. Right. Um, we prefer about 20 by 40 uh, inch square feet, so that it would be 800 square feet. Um, I have gotten uh, questions that they want to show in a, have the show in what looks like somebody's home, which turned into gallery or museums. So as long as um, the person who is asking can send me a floor plan, square footage, and how long they are willing to have their show up, because once we have the panels up, which will take quite a bit of our effort, um, we would like to have the show up over five weeks. Then um, I'll work with any of the galleries. We just yeah. want to do it as widely as possible. Are there any other technical capabilities? For instance, you're hanging from the ceiling there. So that looks like it's required. That's what we would prefer. I don't know how many... Um, venues can accommodate that. Mm -hmm. uh, we might have some wall hangings on accordion style. Uh, yeah. Frame. Um, so uh, a question we had um, about how you handling, how you handle this and, and um, let me just get the questions here. Is there any way, is there a way to know if the stitchers and their work can affect change in the way the world is responding to the refugee crisis? Is it, I mean, we have, the, the work is not really out there except on social media, but that's an interesting question. Um, I'm gonna bring my personal belief in the, answering this question. Um, I think, the change, these social changes actually start from individuals and our heart opening up. Um, that's why it was so important for me for to read the letters that came with the panels, how um, stitching for long hours, like Maggie had mentioned, it makes us contemplate the issue and really truly open up. So. I think that that's a huge social change. All these people working on um, art that touches on um, social activism, where make opening ourselves up. How else does it help? I think um, seeing the project installed, it would be an amazing thing to look at and realize all those stitches, every single one 
represents a human being who doesn't know where their water and food and where to sleep. Nothing for them is certain. And how many of them are suffering in that way? Um, it would be much more, it would be felt viscerally rather than just reading it on the newspaper or um, headlines. I yeah. think that's my answer. <laughs> Can I, jump in? I think I think these art projects, these art activism projects are really effective at getting people to personally contemplate the issues because they're not hard polemics. They're graphics and representations and you you catch the eye and then you keep the people with the subjects, but it is just red line people saw those UN statistics that they had never thought about. You know, you hear a sound bite on the news about refugees, but you don't see the enormous number and, and how many different people are affected. So I think this is a great way to plant the seed in individuals' minds for them to then go and see what they're, how they're gonna take it out into the world. So. Right. Thank you, Maggie. Elaine, did you have anything to add to that? You know, I agree with what Maggie and Jennifer said because I have seen some of Jennifer's other exhibits and it's amazing how, you know, seeing something visually that represents some horrific situation is so much more powerful than reading in the newspaper or watching the evening news. It's just, it really, it, it brings it to your heart and really brings home the enormity of the problem. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we're running close to uh, our time here, but um, first of all, I wanna say that the website really has a lot of information about contacting, about supporting the project, because if this exhibition does travel, there's going to be need some, some support funds for that as well. Um, uh, so check out um, the 25 million stitches.com, right? Is yes. that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a number of suggestions on the, the Q&A about venues. Please feel free to suggest um, to Jennifer and Elaine additional ideas. I, I think also a book project is also very interesting. I, I like the idea of book projects that also devote a portion of proceeds to refugee um, nonprofits or something like that too. So anyway, there's... Um, a lot of uh, things and we're really um, grateful that you could be here today and share this with us. And I encourage everybody to um, follow them on, on social media. And many of you, if you want to contribute, you have two months, just the right amount of time to stitch a panel. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that, um, at this point, I just want to thank uh, a heartfelt thank you to all our sponsors and SACWA for their role in hosting this event. Um, please check the online events page of the SACWA website for recordings of this. You can watch it all over again and it will be on YouTube. Uh, and it is free. People don't need to be uh, a registered member to do that. Please check out the SDA website for more um, information on our organization. And basically, um, join Textile Talks for the next one, which SACWA hosts Conversations with Artists, Opposite Attracts, uh, next week. And personally, I'd like to say, besides a thank you to Jennifer, Elaine, and Maggie, um, best wishes to all of you, and may you feel restored by creativity during this time of challenge and social isolation. See you next Wednesday for another Textile Talk. Thank you.